Welcome to Mad About Money. I'm Maddie Alexander Grout, and this is the podcast where we talk to interesting people all about their interesting money stories. I'm joined today by the lovely Chris Stewart, who is a marketing person. He owns a commercial cleaning business, and he is also a business growth coach as well. Um, Chris has been through a very interesting journey over the last year, um, somewhat not too dissimilar to mine. Um, so I'm quite excited about having a chat with him. Um, Chris, it's lovely to have you on. Um, Tell me a little bit about you, first of all. Thank you. It's lovely to be on. So, yeah, just thanks very much for the introduction. So, I have been in business since 2017. So, I had a, <clears throat> a long corporate career and then I moved into my own business in 2017. So, for the past, what what's that, seven, eight years, I've been working in my own business. So, I'll, I've launched a few of them. So, the first one was back then. And then the space of seven years, I've, I've launched four. So I'm now up to four and then also lost one as well. So um, I've had a bit of a, a kind of a varied business journey. So <clears throat> I've learned a lot from them, but probably, and I think I've said this to you before when we were speaking, and it's something you've mirrored yourself. I think the biggest lessons have came from the one that, that I lost. Failed. Yeah, 100%. Like it's it's so true what they say that you win or you learn. And it's it's a hard one to, when you're in it, and you're in the middle of it all, I think it's it's hard to kind of realise that. But as you start to come out of it, it's so true that it's it's the the failings and the, the things that you lose that give you the biggest teaching. So absolutely, yeah. So tell me a little bit, like where did it all start? What is your money story? What's like the earliest thing that you can remember about money? Oh, for money, um, I was all see when I was younger, I was always someone who wanted to make money. So I did like various things and I don't know if this is where the business thing came in but like I remember being young and I used to um I always had different kind of tricks up my sleeve for making money and I used to go around the doors I remember at one point selling macaroon you remember those mac those macaroon bars you get it's like yeah like I did lots of stuff like that and that, that's the kind of earliest memory I have of making money um I used to have this little thing I'd done where I went around people's doors selling sweets and macaroons but the problem was I used to eat them all so then I had to go <laughs> I, had to, I had to go to my mum and dad and ask for money to pay the guy that was then coming for them for the money for the sweets so um, I've always kind of worked and I've always been interested in doing what I could do to make money um, and I did various different little things when I was younger that I was always interested in so and then as I said I started launching business, my businesses but I was quite late to start with business like I, I was in my 30s before I started um, my okay, first okay what, what did you do before so I worked for, I was in um, the corporate world, so I worked in marketing. I actually started way back, my first job was with British Gas, so I worked in the energy industry. That's so yeah. weird, mine was too. Was it really? Yeah, Um. so when I came out of uni, my first proper job was working in the call centre for British Gas, and then I ended up being their sales trainer. That's what I did as well, what, what call centre were you in? Uh, I, I used to work for um, CPM, which was up in Warrington. Uh, okay, so I was based, so British Gas, I worked with them, they did a call centre in just outside Glasgow. Which ah, I was and then we, we actually had... have the same journey, we're like twins. <laughs> it's so strange. <laughs> and then but weirdly enough, I worked in um, telesales and then became a sales coach and a sales trainer as well. That's yeah. Why it's so weird. Um, that, that is really strange. <laughs> like, especially when you think of all the similarities we've spoken about before. But I know. That thing came up like that is weird. Um so yeah, I worked in British Gas and that was my kind of first step because I worked in the call centre and it was all that thing you always like, you want to go off these phones. Like I love talking, but I was more interested in talking to my friends beside me than talking to the customers. Um, and then I kind yeah. of, I, I then big went into sales training and sales coaching and I loved that. Like I re really enjoyed that. And I then went on to become like the kind of national coach and my job was to then train the coaches who did the sales training and, and all that kind of thing. And from that, I then just worked my way up in British Gas because I, I then get into marketing and learning development. I worked in project management and um and then into strategy as well. So I done really weird. I went into project management after that as well. <laughs> I, I mean, you haven't spent twelve years in recruitment, have you? No, I've not done recruitment yet. So maybe that'll be next. No, 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 don't. No, I'm not going to say it. Like I'm not going to say it. But like twelve years of recruitment almost broke me. So yeah, don't do that. <laughs> So yeah, that was my kind of corporate career, um, and I worked, and then I kind of I ended up in marketing, um, and brand and senior roles, and that's where I stayed for a few years. But I always wanted to do something more, and I had three young kids, and I kind of the idea for my first business. So I uh, I hated going to soft plays. Let's see those, um, are really, and I mean there is good ones out there, but I used to go in 
and it was always those like cold industrial units and yeah mouths smelling of fried food and chips and it was like the cheap plastic tables and your, your little ones would go away and they'd come out you couldn't find them and then you were in there trying to find them and they'd be crying because a big boy hurt them and all this kind of thing so I wanted to do something different so I had taken over a it was a Chinese restaurant that was local so I took over this Chinese restaurant and I created it was a, an imaginative play cafe which was basically it was for under five so it was for young children um, and it had on one side the restaurant and in the other side was this like little imaginative town. So it was amazing. A and it was like a fire station, a police station, a supermarket, a beauty salon, and a shop. And it was all about role playing. Like they used to dress up and all that kind of thing. So, but it, the whole idea behind it was it was somewhere that parents wanted to go. So it was your kind of family's happy place that like you wanted to go. It was good food, good coffee, a unique menu for kids and adults. So, and that was, um, and the concept behind it was like for parents. Because they choose where they want to go. Like kids will play anywhere. Yeah. So they love it. But you also give a great experience for the parents and do it completely different from anything that you they usually experience in the kind of kids' play places. And they and normally just disappear and leave you when you go to role play places. Like I I have very, very fond memories. And I'm I'm actually really sad that my kids are too old for those type of places <laughs> now. Like I, I think my five year old probably isn't. Um, but her brother, who is eight, yeah, definitely it's a bit old for him now. But yeah, I think they are they're just so nice and it's a welcome change because they go off they they're learning they're learning through play and it's like real world situations and it's lovely because it's not that horrible like noisy a hundred percent and that's yeah. why the restaurant side of it i thought if you combine that but you have a restaurant and a restaurant setting then you actually feel as a parent that you're out like you're not because your kids are away entertained but rather than sitting in a soft play, you're actually sitting in a restaurant having nice food and nice coffee. And so that was my first one. Then it just came from my own like hatred of soft, <laughs> hatred of soft plays. Um, but the funny thing was, Matt, when I when I took over it, it, the Chinese restaurant, we used to go to it, and my oldest son loved it. It was a Chinese buffet. And then when, when I took over the building, it then closed down and I took over it. So he thought it was my fault. So he started saying to me, <laughs> Is this your fault that this is closed? So I was like the bad guy. And I'm like, no, it wasn't me. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> oh. That was my first venture then into kind of making like my own money, like serious money and making good money. So off my own back, but also having the responsibility of 15 staff and being responsible for them paying their bills and paying their mortgages and all that kind of thing. So um, it did it's come. It's heavy. It's heavy, isn't it? It is. And then at the same time, we had that, I had the, that business for five years, five, six years. Um, so that was a lot, that went into lockdown as well. So we also had the lockdown challenge of yeah. managing a business through lockdown for, well, and we were the last to open back up because kids' places were seen as, they opened the pubs before they opened kids' places. So you could get a beer before your kids could play. Like, I know it's crazy. I know. It was, it was, it was absolutely insane. And I, th I think the thing is, like, I think they thought like, oh yeah, kids are breeding ground, you know, it's breeding ground. But like pubs are literally breeding grounds. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I thought, what a British mentality, open the pubs before we let the kids play. Like it's, it's crazy. So, and the thing is we were last to get funding because when they were introducing grants, they didn't include kids places in the grants. No, they didn't, did they? Again, no. you were arguing saying, well, why are pubs getting grants and funding in places that your kids go? Kids that are actually not in school, that are locked in the house, but you're actually, you're going to let these places go under and they're going to need them when they come back. Like it's so, yeah. so that was probably, and that was my biggest kind of probably money challenge because at that point you had, you still had to pay your rent, still had to pay bills. It, the staff weren't followed at that point and so there was, that was probably my first time of real financial pressure, but I thought like, because it's not just your own bills you're having to pay, you're responsible for 15 other people's bills as well. So yeah, the big one, like coming through lockdown. So, but we did it, we came through the other end. So it worked out in the end. It's just, it, it, it's, it's amazing that you managed to come out the other end. Like it's, it's scary how many people didn't, you know, my business was one of them. Um, you know, when you're running a, a discount card that helps people to shop local and people can't actually shop local because they can't leave the house, you know, that was an incredibly difficult time. Um, and, you know, it's still, it's still going on today. You know, I'm, I'm still not kind of free of all of the hassle. Um, you know, every single, every single day, I think, you know, 
it's got to be the end of it soon because it it just keeps carrying on um i think you know the same i know you had similar situations with you know investors who lost their money you know it's really horrible you know that was the most horrific conversation that i ever had to have with anybody the business has gone under you've lost your money it was horrific like i can't think of anything that i've ever been through in my life including part postpartum psychosis being suicidal like all of those kind of things nothing compared to having to tell people they'd lost their money just mm-hmm. horrible situation i know and i remember like when we closed the doors and it was the concern for the staff and i was saying to them like oh, it'll be like two or three months and we'll be back don't worry like you'll get your wages and i thought yeah I'll work it out like and luckily we had some money like in the bank to cover that but we then had to kind of spin what we did so we then i think like most people did we then opened up um like home deliveries and we had the lucky thing is we had a big um following and a big audience yeah because when we opened up we were one of the only ones in at the time in central scotland that had that concept in the, in the restaurant so we had, we had people traveling as well with a massive facebook following so we then kind of pivoted and started doing um, like deliveries, but for fam- like for kids and families. So we'd all these different kind of fun, like make your own things and we done various Oh, amazing. But, and I had, a, and at one point we had one of our um, customers contacted us and we started doing like afternoon tea boxes and all these things as well. So, and then we got a phone call one day, we were getting like some, like a few deliveries a day and different things. And then I had a phone call from a customer who said, um, that their work wanted to do, do a delivery of afternoon teas for their home workers. Oh, wow. Asked, I'm like, great, that's fine, right, brilliant. Like, how many do you need? And she's like, like, 1,400. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Um, and they were all over central Scotland and down in the air and all sorts. So, so I had, like, my uncle, my dad, like, everyone just in, like, like firing out these boxes, like, packing up the cars and just sending them off with, like, their sat-nav. So, um, so that kind of, we, and then from that, we got more business orders as well, and it kind of grew. So, that really helped us through lockdown. Like it's just getting that money in, like and getting that revenue and kept us going. So, and on the back of it, we actually launched a second business. So there was a part of the building that we had never, that we didn't use. So that became, we turned that into a takeaway. So it became a street food take, because once we were in the kind of takeaway game, yeah. so we turned that into a, a street food takeaway. So it was different, branded, and the, the business was branded differently. So in the outside, the one building had like two different trading businesses. But behind the scenes, it was the same kitchen, the same staff, the same everything. So it was quite good. So we then got like another revenue stream because we had two businesses, businesses going out the, the one building, which was great. However, after we came out of lockdown, <laughs> and you've heard this story after we came out of lockdown, and then I think we were about two years, the first business went under, which is a whole different story we'll talk about, a whole yeah. financial money learning. But the first business went under, and then the real kicker was the second business because it was in the same building, which and it was going well. When we ended that lease, we had to let that one go as well, which was a real. Oh, it's to... it's awful, isn't it? And I think I think actually we were about two years after the pandemic when when my business failed as well. I think it was just the knock on effect of everything that had happened. You know, the stop start stop start. And I think people changed their habits as well. They didn't go out as much um, and people started shopping online more. And it it was really, it was a massive culture shift, I think, wasn't it? And not even that, when we came out of it, we then get hit with a cost of living crisis. Oh my God. So it I was... just had the most. I just had the most horrific. Like I just. Do you know what? Do you ever get a panic where like I'm like I didn't press record. I did. We're all good. But I just, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I just had that like. Oh my god! Did I actually do something? Yeah, it's fine. We're all good. <laughs> if, you just, if you just say all that again, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> We're all fine. Oh, damn my ADHD brain. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm bad for doing that when I'm doing kind of videos and stuff in my business and, and it annoys me because you get the great one and you finally get one you nail it and you go I've not bloody recorded that like just joking um, <laughs> it always happens doesn't it crazy anyway sorry to interrupt go on carry on um so yeah but then we went into a cost of living crisis and it's I, ironically it's that fun enough it's that one that killed us and not the pandemic not like, the pandemic yeah same here so we get through that and then because the thing is our audience was young families so who's been hit worst by a cost of living crisis? Like so, and at the same time as though them getting hit by a cost of living crisis and interest rates and inflation and all sorts, so customer spending plummeted. But at the same time, 
our costs went through the roof so early. Like, mm. Everything, like our energy bill was eye-watering. Like I couldn't believe the difference. Like our business rates went up, all our services went up because you pay everything you pay from from your bins to your water rates to the yeah. oil, your fire, your food. Like everything showed up because all these service providers were then trying to club in revenue after lockdown on the back of businesses who were then getting hit by a crisis that was reducing customer spend. So we that's what that's what really impacted us. So that's when we got to the point. And as I said, the second business out, the, out of the one building was doing well. But that, because it was our takeaway, so it was working because of the, mm. where we were now, we're in the world, and as you say, different shop, different kind of consumer habits, so, and the takeaway one was going well, but this other one was was taking a real hammering, and that's where all the costs were sitting in this big building, so, um, and unfortunately, the business went under, and then one one thing that I, I kind of would say as well, though, that when I look back at the, at the time, like, I was, I was angry about it, I was annoyed, like, I was frustrated, yeah. I was blaming everything, but one of the, the kind of biggest learnings for me coming out of that, and I remember I read it somewhere and it said how it was about taking responsibility for things, whether it's your fault or not. And yeah. I thought it was great because I looked back at that and went, right, we get taking away cost of living crisis and all that. Like, what could I have done differently? And it's, a, it's something I would always recommend to people to do, whether it's your fault or not, because it, cause it, it prompts you to then start trying to learn from it. And you start looking at it and going, well, what could I have done differently? And it's a great technique and a great lesson to do because absolutely, yeah. Anything else you do, like it's always take responsibility, even if it's not your fault, because you've got to think of ways you could have done something different. So exactly that, and and that that was you know that was that was the process that I went through, um, and it was you know what did I learn about this business? What could I have done differently? What 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 actually happened to make it go? Um, mm. And, you know, for, for us, it was it was the tech. Um, so me and my naivety thinking that we could raise £86,000 through a crowdfunding campaign. I mean, ideally, we were trying to raise two fifty, which actually in the, in the grand scheme of things, even that wouldn't have been enough mm-hmm. um, because the tech was so expensive. And to build good tech that actually works, you need like 500 grand plus. Mm-hmm. Um, we were on a hiding to nothing. What I If I'd have changed anything, I would have kept it as a discount card that we had um and i wouldn't have spent the money on the tech because once you start spending money on tech it's a bottomless pit um and we got to the point where we had no money in the bank um and i went to my i went to my shareholders and i said we've got no money in the bank we're we're going to go under and what i should have done was at that point i should have closed the business but i didn't because i really 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 wanted to make a go of it i was so stubborn i was like that this has been my baby for seven years i want to make this succeed and not only that it was like i knew i had investors who i needed to get their money back i really wanted to help them so i ended up taking out debt um i took out loans i took out credit cards i did everything in my possible power to end up saving that business but it just wasn't enough. And then I couldn't afford to make the repayments because stuff hadn't gone, you know, stuff hadn't pushed forward enough. Um, and then when I finally closed the business, I ended up with £40,000 worth of debt personally that I actually owed personally. Um, you know, you always think that a limited company, you're protected. Mm-hmm. You're not because you have to read the small print and ADHD Maddie does not read small print on things. So, you know, there were a lot of things that I would have changed um, in that circumstance. Um, But, you know, I've still got people who are cross with me today. And it's like I did everything like I I had a nervous breakdown. My health was so bad. I was in and out of hospital. Um, You know, people don't see what goes on behind the scenes when you close a business. And it is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Right, 100 percent. And it's funny you saying that because it's again, it's totally matters like what I did as well. So and it's something I always share with people like you always fight to save something. You always fight for your business. You'll fight to save it. Absolutely. Sometimes when something's inevitable, you should accept it and try and kind of damage limitation because what I did, same as you, when I knew probably like for a few months before it actually happened, I knew where it was going and I didn't tell anyone, like nobody knew, like not even, I don't just tell the business. I mean, like my family, my partner, like I didn't tell anyone, like I was just like, you know, something like, again, that's something I would say to people like, don't talk I, because the thing is and i've always said thought like well i can't it's a it's a weight but i carry it well but it's still heavy and even though you think people don't know like i remember my mum saying to me like i knew something was wrong with you because you just weren't yourself but you, you, you're painting this face on and it's horrible because you're having to it's like the sad clown thing isn't it you've got this face on but inside you're in kind of turmoil and um 
Academy. And, and that's that's what it is. That's such a good word to to kind of use. Turmoil. Like I felt like my world was ending. Like it was it was almost like something had died. Mm-hmm. Um, like you know, and I think like as an ADHD, or I take things an awful lot harder than some people would if they were neurotypical. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, it was like not only the fact was I a massive failure because my business had failed, but I'd lost people money and people hated me, and it was just you know I did everything I could like I didn't want my business to fail I loved it like Mm -hmm. it was it was my life you know it was my lifeblood you know I'd been running it for seven years and it was something that I had been so passionate about um and you know it it was hard to kind of take the thing and be like you know it's not the it's not the pandemic that's killed this it's do you know what it was actually like my naivety of thinking that I could build an app for the money that I thought I could um and you know that was that was a hard thing but you know when it's your first business you learn so much um and I learned most definitely never to do that again like it's you know I've got a new app now um but I haven't I haven't done it the way that we did that at all you know I, I use somebody else's software so it's cost a hell of a lot less than than it would have done I tested the concept um I tested it worked and I tested that people would actually like it before you know we went and spent any money on it um and we're still not making money from that app now. It's, you know, it's, we, we launched in May last year. We're still not making any money. It's coming. It's going to happen at some point. Um, but, you know, I wanted to make sure that before I took anybody's money, we knew exactly what we were doing. Um, and it's it's been a journey um, for sure. And, you know, it's been, there have been sleepless nights. There have been, you know, health issues, mental health issues. And I think anybody who, hasn't been through that they just don't get it they don't understand what that burden feels like um but you don't want to be a victim you don't want to sit there and just be like oh yeah and wallow in it forever so you have to kick yourself up the bum and you have to go and get started again even if you know it's going to get you some criticism from some people who just don't understand we have to make a living we have to get on with we have to carry on with our lives you know we can't let one failure determine the rest of our lives and the success that we've got to give you can and it's it's I now see it and it's a weird thing to say because I would never have said this before, but part of me sees it now as a strength and that I have because that experience and it's something a lot of people won't go through. A lot of people will, a lot of people won't, but the experience of losing that, but but then how I the how I then how to turn it around because very few yeah. people have that massive low in business. And actually it's your worst nightmare, your business going under. I mean it's your worst nightmare as a business yeah. owner. For that to happen, I lost not I lost two overnight. Like I lost one, and then it took the other one down. So I went from having three businesses going to then one. Um, and as I said, it was turmoil, and it was hard, and I was hiding it. And what I'd done the same as you, like I, when I knew it was going under, I was started the last month or two. I was paying the wages out in one pocket. So um, same here, yeah. In, at the time, I thought because my staff, I had staff that had been with me from the very start, and it was my first business. Like you say, it was your baby, and I spent when we took over that. Um, venue, as I said, it was a restaurant. Like I did, we I had a small budget to get, get to, to do it, so I did all of the work myself. Like I was down there every night, Monday to Friday. I would go down at the weekends from nine in the morning to nine at night working. So and I did that for four months. So I was a massive chunk. Mm. I used to take the kids down with me when I was doing it as well. Um, I had another baby. I took young kids and another baby on the way. Um, so it was a massive part of my life. I then launched it. The and I know it sounds like a cliche, but the the, the staff became like family and like my, the managers who ran it for me became really good friends of mine and they were going through I knew stuff of their personal lives they were going through with money and different things so for me to then go this is going to go under and I'm going to they're going to lose their job so I started paying the wages out in my own pocket yeah. and in reality when it closed they went and found other jobs and moved on like but I was then left with all this mess to clear up um suppliers to pay like agreements leases to get out of um personal personal guaranteed finance in the business like I was left with all of that and I thought and then I'm going that money I paid out in my own pocket I could really be doing with this just now like so I think when you know it's inevitable like it's it's damage limitation and sometimes you've got to accept it but as I said it's a pride it's a pride thing isn't it because you're so you're so proud and you're like you know I don't want this to fail. I don't want to publicly look like a complete loser and like, you know, like I've done it wrong. You go as well. Um, and I, I carried it on for probably a year after its sell-by date just mm. because of my pride, because mm. of the fact that I didn't want people to lose any money, 
Um, and that was to my own detriment. Um, you know, I ended up with, with 40,000 pounds worth of personal debt from all the personal guarantees. Um, and I could have avoided that, which would have, you know, mm -hmm. somehow softened the blow a little bit. Um, but I carried on and you know what, like it's, it's been a very, very tough learning curve, but the things that I've learned and the things that I can teach other people now, um, of what not to do, um, you know, sometimes you just have to admit defeat and go, do you know what? This isn't working. Let's try something else. Um, it's it's all it's obviously a lot harder when you've got people who are invested in it and you owe suppliers money, etc. Like, you know, that's that is it's really tough. Um, and they and it it's the mental, the mental sort of load of having those people coming at you and coming at you and coming at you till you feel like you're like the worst person in the world. Um, but it is business at the end of the day. I know it is, um, but as I say, like for me, the that learning, like to be in that kind of low place. I mean, I, I was in a bad place with it, like when it happened, and like financially. I remember us talking at the time. Uh, just, uh, like financially, mentally, emotionally, and as I said, I'd been kind yeah. of myself. Like, um, and I felt like even like I, I was like a bit like I felt kind of like a robot, like you were just kind of going through the motions, but inside, like it was you were in turmoil and you were painting a face on, but. For me, the biggest thing that, and it's, and I'm actually now grateful for it. And I, again, I've never thought I'd have said that, but who you had to then become and what you had to do to get yourself back on track. So, because yeah. you've got to drag yourself out of that place. And I was doing so much, and I was like, and I was, it was all about mindset. Like everything was mindset. And I kind of like, it is, isn't it? If you believe you can, you will. Um, and, and that's the thing. I, you know, I struggled for such a long time with, you know, what do I do? How do I get over this? Can I even do this? I went and got a job. And that was the worst thing I could have done, I think, because, you know, I am built to be an entrepreneur. I'm unemployable. Like my ADHD is so rife. And so like, you know, all of my neurodivergence conditions together mean that I'm not particularly great at working for other people. Um, so, you know, I had to still stay self-employed and I'm so glad that I did. You know, my my TikTok business is absolutely thriving. My coaching business is really great. Um, you know, the app is, you know, it's growing. Um, despite the fact that it's not making any money, I'm making enough money from other places to like still be able to prop it up and it'd still be fine. You know, I'm putting a lot of my own money into it, but it it's that, you know, I've I've not come this far just to come this far type of mentality. That's what I think too, hundred percent. Um, but it is it's, and I had kind of thrown myself into like mind, like mindset techniques and like just kind of devouring everything I could get for it. I thought I need to get back to being me. Like, cause I, this isn't who I am, like, and it really affected me, but I thought I need to get back and I need to kind of build myself back up. And as I said, I now look at it as a strength because I go, it's something I, I share with people and like, I, and that's why I'm, ha I'm happy to talk about now. And it's weird yeah. because you carry that, you carry it because and hide it because you're embarrassed and ashamed, but see the actual solution to getting rid of all that is talking about it because you kind of take the power back, don't you? And you then they kind of own it. And then it becomes something yeah. you go, actually, I now use it to help other people. And I'm happy to talk about it now, like something I had, for so long and was embarrassed about it. I now talk about it in social media. I post about it. I talk about it in podcasts. Like I'm failure going... leads to success. Like it's always been my thing. But the thing is, when you're going through that failure, it doesn't seem successful. Oh, it feels gosh. awful. Um, you know, if it, it feels like your world is coming down around you and there's nothing you can do at all to to help it. And if you're um, you then like or and so it, uh, Further down the line, you're going to see this as a positive and a strength, not like I made, I made a punch in the face. You know I, mean? like, <laughs> I was feeling like, like I thought, I, like I don't, I, I'll never think this is a positive. But I think people said that to me, and I was just like, "You try living this. You try going through it. You try having like all of these people coming at you all the time. You know, it's it's so draining." Um, but the the thing that that turned my life around, um, you know, was was actually even more tragedy. Like my mother in law passed away, and it made me realize that I was grieving for, for a thing, for a business, um, instead of grieving for a person. And then I kind of transferred my grief because my me and my mother-in-law were, were really close. And it was that, that was, you know, the time, I mean, it was two months after the business went under. Um, my mum paid for us to go to Lapland, mm -hmm. um, which was like the same week that my mother-in-law passed away. So me and my mum and the kids, we went to Lapland, we had an amazing time. Um, you know, I didn't even take my purse with me because I was that poor. Like I had nothing. I didn't have a stick to rub together like at all. Um, and it was being somewhere away from social media. It gave me that opportunity to think about 
what to do next you know what what is this all about um and I stopped grieving I stopped grieving for the business um I decided to like completely close the door and just not even think about it anymore um and it was hard it was really tough to do that but I decided that future me would appreciate Mm -hmm. me putting it to bed yeah so I put it to bed I mean it's still never been to bed properly you know I still get people even even now you know talking about it Mm -hmm. um you know and it's it's one of those things where I think like I've got nothing to hide you know I did everything by the book um you know people tried to sway me to do things not by the book and I said no and I'm glad that I kept my ethics and my morals throughout the whole of the situation um and then you know fast forward a year um you know my businesses are now successful my new businesses which I'm really enjoying running um so yeah so what's next for Chris? What's what's the what's the exciting stuff? Let's let's get out of the the crappy <laughs> hole that we've just got ourselves into. I know. Um, we'll be cracking open the wine soon. Um, so yeah, I've been <laughs> drunk for seven weeks. I'm on the sober train. Christ. <laughs> I know. I actually, had a glass of wine last night for the first time in a long time. Like I've kind of been the same. Like, but I, I had a bottle of red wine. Someone bought me for my birthday last month, so I thought I'm going to have a treat myself Do you know what like I I miss it in a way but I also don't like I you know having had the worst year of my life mental health wise like drinking is not where I need to be so you know I used to use it as a bit of a crutch like I've never been an alcoholic or anything like that but you know I would go out and binge drink and binge drinking when you've got ADHD and you've got no off switch is not a great thing when you're already struggling mental health wise so I just thought you know what I'll knock it on the head for a bit see what happens it's been seven weeks so far I'm feeling pretty good about it it's so much better for you. Like, and again, I wasn't like yeah. alcoholic or anything, but like I did like a bottle of wine and had something. And what the, the trap I fell into was because I used to work every night when the kids went to bed because I was so busy um, with business, I would open a bottle of wine and sit and that became a like kind of ritual. Like I'd go, I'll have a glass of wine, sit my laptop at the kitchen table and work away. But then before you know it, you're having like a bottle of wine and, and then mm. you're up mornings I'm going, no, this needs to stop. So you do, you feel, see when you, you don't drink, like, and I'll go months and months without drinking and you feel so much better, like mentally, physically, like it is. Like, like, it's, 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 it's interesting, actually. Like, I mean, I like, it's weird though, because people judge you in a, in like a weird kind of, you're an alien type thing. If you say to them, you I don't just, drink. They judge um, you for not drinking than for drinking. Like, that, yeah. Like, there's something wrong with you. Like, and it's a whole, I, uh, why are you not drinking? And go just accept someone's not drinking and just offer them a non-alcoholic drink and move on. Like, why, why is it got to be crazy? I, I am like one of the most fun people on a night out ever. Um, but at least I know I'm not going to pass out at the table or vomit on somebody or like, <laughs> you know, fall into a bush or like do something that I regret. Um, and I can still have that much fun. And it was it was weird. It was that kind of swapping, like, because you're still out and you're still drinking. The action of drinking you're still out you're still having fun you're still drinking you're still socializing it's just not got any alcohol in it that was the, the mindset switch that i needed you know what i've noticed as well see if you do go out and drink like non-alcoholic beer or something you kind of get in the, it must be like it's your trick in your mind because because you're drinking and like opening a you bottle almost stuff, feel you like almost you're drinking feel like you're drinking like it does something like it's, it's i know I, f- I got in my car to drive home and I was like, I shouldn't be driving. I feel quite drunk, but I'm not drunk. I'm just happy. Like, and it's a different, it's a different emotion. That is an, a, the, a whole other podcast, I think. It's like, yeah. So what's going on for you business-wise now? How can people work with you? So I've, um, so I've got a commercial cleaning company. So I've had that for three years now, um, which is kind of went from strength to strength. Like it's, we've ended up in just by chance, we ended up in the Airbnb business. Oh, um, nice kind of exploded so we, we had like two airbnbs that wanted to work with us and then just through word of mouth and the kind of glasgow airbnb scene um it exploded and we ended up with loads and loads of these airbnbs that we look after so amazing uh, yeah that's been going great still still have the bit the commercial business and it's going from strength to strength and then my new thing that i'm working on is that i've launched uh as the small business startup coach so i'm now as i said i've launched four or five businesses in my my time i actually six i've launched six um since 2017 um i've had four that's when i started as well we so we're so, <laughs> i've had i've had about that many as well <laughs> <laughs> they've launched six of them um i've had great success with businesses i've had all the ups and downs i've had failure i've lost a business 
Um, I've also had big corporate jobs and learned from all the kind of the big players what they do. So I've got loads of experience. I even see that business failure as I've learned from that as well. So it's something to share. So um, and it's something I love doing. Like I and maybe why I've got I ended up with multiple businesses is I love the startup phase. I love that excitement and everything you've got to work through. Like I get a buzz from that part of it. So I've started working with business owners. So um, um and it's pretty new for me working with people that are either starting a business or are in the early stage of their business journey. And then bringing, letting me kind of step into their business and step into their world and share my experience and kind of working with them through their plans, um, helping them with strategy, sales. We should marketing. definitely do more. We should definitely do more together because, like that that startup bit, like I kind of pick people up after they've been like maybe trying to do something for a year, you know, or that or they've they've already got their thing and they need to market it. Mm-hmm. Um, so like my stuff is all about like visibility and growing your social media and growing a personal brand and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, we should definitely like hook up and like hundred percent. We'll talk about it definitely. Yeah, I love that. So that how how do people get in touch with you? So I'm um, um online website my social media. So I'm um, the my website is the business startup coach dot co dot uk. Um, and the same for my social media handles as well. So um, I'm on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, the usual ones. So my Facebook one, actually, because I've, I've got my Facebook group has always been, I've always had a big Facebook following because back in 2018, and again, something similar to what you're doing now, I wrote a children's book. So oh. I have another thing. Um, I feel like we are the same person. The same person, just in different bodies. Uh-huh. Um, I wrote a children's book. So it started with my, I used to write, I always liked to write and I've always enjoyed it. Um, and I used to write stories for my children and this, I decided I was going to write them a book but then it just grew arms and legs and it, I launched and it got published so i done that so back then I had an author's page on Facebook which grew and grew and grew and then I've just kind of like repurposed that um, and at the time I used because when I when I lost a business I was I started sharing a lot of stuff around like mindset personal development and it was more like a kind of therapy for me than anything yeah. when I started doing that people were into it and then it grew grew further so um, so yeah, I'm across all social medias. Um, I'm online. My website, as I say, is the business startup coach. So, and that's what I'm looking to do. It's just, it's just kind of step into people's world at that start of their journey and help them. I've got so many people that will say to me because I have launched businesses and I'm kind of known for it, and especially locally, say like, I've got this idea, but I don't know what to do, or um, yeah. I've a business, or I'm just starting out. Like, can you help me? So, um, and I, and that's what I enjoy doing. Like, I, I really do enjoy that part of it. So. I can help them get started, um, what to do, what not to do, and just kind of be there for people through that part of their journey because it is yeah. so much, and you, you know yourself, there's so much to do when you start a business and it's a bit of a minefield, especially if you're like like myself. I did, I'd worked in big businesses, but I'd never started my own. And I'm just a kind of normal cla- normal working class guy from a working class town. Like I never had any, I didn't come from a business family or money. Or no. Anything. So, and I think that, that whole mindset thing as well, like it took me a while I used to always do, have that imposter syndrome thing where I'd go, like, I'm just Chris from, like, a little town outside Glasgow. Like, um, and I think even when business, when one of my business failed, that starts to play again. Like, you start to get that back in your mind going up. Yeah. Go, like, uh, so, um, who, am I, who am I to do it again? I've just had this massive failure. Like, also, um, and I love the mindset thing. I love, like, I love working with people around their mindset and just the different techniques and tools and strategies to, Kind of develop the right mindset for business and just for life in general like yeah awesome. amazing chris thank you for being so open and honest okay. and talking about a subject which people don't talk about enough mm-hmm. um you know there are so many businesses i think there are like thousands of businesses that fail on a daily basis um it's about failing forward and it's about using your experience to make the world better and help help other people so i really appreciate your honesty um and it's lo- been lovely to have you on um guys go and follow chris um his content's amazing as well um if you are listening to this podcast on spotify or apple music please hit the subscribe button please share this with your friends it's really important that we get these money stories out there and we talk more openly about money if you haven't downloaded the mad about money app yet you can download that as well for free um it is for people wherever they are in their money journey, uh, whether you are in debt, whether you are saving for something, whether you are you know, just trying to be better at managing your money, whether you're starting a business, whether you're looking into entrepreneurship or a side hustle, it is for everybody. 
Um, so go and download it. Um, there is a high, heavy focus on neurodivergent people because neurodivergent people struggle with money more than anybody else. But it doesn't mean that if you are not neurodivergent, you can't come in. Um, so go and check it out. Um, I'm Maddie Alexander Grout. You can follow me on TikTok at Mad About Money Official. Um, I hit a million, a million likes today on TikTok. I'm very excited about it. Um, so you can go and follow me there. Um, and make sure that you follow and subscribe to this so you can hear the next episode. We'll see you next time.